Welcome to this next video in the playlist on group theory. In this video, what we're going to study is groups of order p squared times q, where p is a prime and q is a prime. So groups which have an order, which when you take its prime factorization, there are only two primes in there. One prime is raised to the power of 2, and the other prime is raised to the power of 1. Okay, so, let me give you some examples firstly to make this more concrete. So we've got some finite group which we'll call capital G, which is of order P squared Q. And note that I'm not making any assumptions about which of the two primes, P or Q, is larger and which is smaller. Okay, P could be smaller than Q or Q could be smaller than P. It can be either way around. Okay, so let me give you some concrete examples of orders uh, that groups can have uh, which would satisfy this. Okay, so an example is 12. 12, if we take its prime factorization, it's 2 squared times 3. So in this case, P would be equal to 2 and Q would be equal to 3. Another example is 18. Okay, and if we take the prime factorization of 18, it's 3 squared times 2. So the other way around, if you like, P is now equal to 3 and Q is equal to 2. So this illustrates that um, P can either be smaller than Q, as in this case, or it can be larger than Q, as in this case. Okay, to take some more examples, another example would be, for instance, 20. 20 is 2 squared times so P would in this case be 2 and Q would be 5 and I'm sure you can easily devise more examples so just stick one prime in here, another prime in here uh, and you can come up with many other numbers that um, we are talking about okay so groups of those orders we're uh, going to be making theorems about them in this video Okay, so there's one great theorem then that I want to show you in this video okay which is that Groups of an order, of order p squared q, always contain a normal Seedorf subgroup. So here's the great claim, so I'll call this the great claim of this video, okay? Uh, this group, so our finite group of order p squared times q, always contains a normal Seedorf subgroup, okay? Always contains a normal Seedorf subgroup. Okay, now of course it will have Seedorf subgroups pertaining to uh, two different primes. Okay, we have two primes appearing in the prime factorization. So Seedorf's theorem tells us about the existence of Seedorf P subgroups and Seedorf Q subgroups. And the claim is that for one of these, at least one of these, uh, it will uh, be the case that, that it has a normal Seedorf P subgroup or a normal Seedorf Q subgroup. Okay, it always contains a normal Seedorf subgroup. Okay, and it's at least one. I'm not saying that it can only contain one. I'm saying that it contains at least one. It might contain more than one. But every single group of order p squared times q always contains a normal Seedorf subgroup. Either a Seedorf p subgroup that is normal or a Seedorf q subgroup that is normal. And therefore we can instantly conclude that any group of order p squared times q is not a simple group because here is a normal subgroup that it contains that is not the improper subgroup or the trivial subgroup. Okay, right, so this is the claim then that I want to show in this video, that any group of order p squared times q always contains a normal Seedorf subgroup, either for p or for q. Okay, so let's begin the proof of this result. So how are we going to prove this result? Well, we're going to take the two different cases. We're going to split the proof into two different cases. And the two different cases are going to be, firstly, there is the option that the prime P is greater than the prime Q. And the second case is going to be the case where the prime Q is bigger than the prime P. And I want to stress here that P and Q are not allowed to be equal to the same thing. We're not talking about groups of order a prime cubed here. P and Q must be different primes, okay, for this to hold, well, for this proof to hold. Okay, so therefore we can conclude that either P is greater than Q, or it's the other way around, Q is greater than P. And case 1 is going to be the case where P is strictly greater than Q. Okay, so this one's really easy, okay? Uh, I claim that if P is greater than Q, then we're only going to have one Seedorf P subgroup. Okay, so if you work out the number of Seedorf P subgroups, it must equal 1, and therefore if we call capital P this one and only Seedorf P subgroup, 
of the group capital G, then P is going to be a normal subgroup inside of G. It has to be because um, whatever you conjugate G by, sorry, whatever you conjugate capital P by, so whatever little g you pick from capital G to conjugate capital P by, you must end up with another subgroup of the same size. I'm saying there's only one subgroup of that size in G, okay, therefore you must end up with this subgroup back again. So when you conjugate capital P by any element of the group capital G, you must just get this subgroup back again, hence it will be normal. In fact, you can say even stronger than that, you can say it will be characteristic in the group capital G, uh, because as I say, there's only one subgroup of that size, so any automorphism of the group capital G um, must therefore map the subgroup capital P onto itself. Okay, but of course normality and characteristic, being characteristic inside a group, are the same thing in the context of CLOV subgroups. Because if you're normal, if you're a normal CLOV uh, subgroup, then that implies there's only one of them uh, because all CLOV subgroups are conjugates to one another. And if there's only one of them, that implies that you're characteristic in G. So we'll just put that P is normal in G. And the understanding that it's a CLOV uh, subgroup will then lead us to understand that it's also characteristic in G. Okay, right. So how can we prove this? Well, of course, we just use the third Seelov theorem. So the number of Seelov P subgroups by the third Seelov theorem must divide what is left over in the prime factorization of the order of the group after you've got rid of the highest power that P appears to. So get rid of P squared, what you're left over with is Q. So the number of Seelov P subgroups must divide Q. The second part of the Seelov third theorem tells us that the number of Seelov P subgroups must be congruent to one modulo P, i.e. it must be of the form 1 plus K times P, where K is greater than or equal to zero. Okay, now using these two together, along with the condition that P is strictly greater than Q, we arrive at the conclusion that the only option is that MP is equal to 1. And the reason is, is that if you let K equal, for instance, 1, you'll then get that MP is equal to 1 plus P. Okay, is 1 plus P going to divide Q? Well, of course it's not, because look, P is strictly greater than Q, so 1 plus P is certainly greater than Q. Okay, so it's not going to divide Q. Okay, so there's no chance at all that if k is greater than 0, that 1 plus k times p is going to divide q. So the only option is that mp must equal 1, and therefore we have only one seed of p subgroup. The first seed of theorem tells us that we must have 1. Okay, you find this one and only seed of p subgroup, which will of course have order p squared. That's going to be a normal subgroup inside of G, because as they say, whenever you conjugate any subgroup by an element of the group, it must map it onto another subgroup of the same order. If there's only one subgroup in the group of that order, it must just map it back onto itself. Hence, it must be a normal subgroup. Hence, we've proven the theorem if P uh, is strictly greater than Q. So there's case one done very, very easily. Now let's swap, our, swap it around. So now let's say that Q is the bigger one. Q is greater than P, case two. Okay, right. We want to prove again that there is going to be a normal Seedorf subgroup. Okay, so the way I'm going to do this is I'm going to, um, well, we're going to now look at seed of Q subgroups rather than seed of P subgroups. Okay, so if Q is greater than P, I claim that you can either conclude that the number of seed of Q subgroups is equal to 1, or you can instantly say that your group has order 12, and then from the previous video in the playlist on uh, group theory of groups of order 12, we know that any group of order 12 is always going to contain a normal seed of subgroup. Either it will contain a normal seed of free subgroup, or it will contain uh, a normal seed of two subgroup. And indeed, if it contains a normal seed of two subgroup, it will be, well, sorry, no. Either it will contain a normal seed of free subgroup or it will be isomorphic to the alternating group on the set of four elements and the alternating group on the set of four elements contains a normal seed of two subgroup of order four okay and therefore we can always conclude that a group of order 12 will contain a normal seed of subgroup and indeed that's the ending comment that i make in the video on groups of order 12 okay so we'll be done okay so let me firstly show you this so Let's again apply the third Seedorf theorem here. Okay, so NQ, the number of Seedorf Q subgroups then. By the third Seedorf theorem, this must divide what's left over, which is P squared, once we've taken away the highest power of Q, which is just Q, 
also by the third seed of theorem, it must be congruent to one modulo q, so it must be of the form one plus kq, where k is greater than or equal to zero. Okay, right, so now let's try and understand this. Okay, and remember q is greater than p, so if nq has to divide p squared, what are the only options? nq has to either equal one, or it has to equal p, or it has to equal p squared. If nq is equal to 1, then that implies we have only one seed of q subgroup, and of course that seed of q subgroup, which we might as well call capital Q, uh, is then going to be a normal subgroup inside G for exactly the same argument as we had there. So that's very, very simple. Okay, so that's the first option here. Can nq equal p? Can I make 1 plus kq equal p? Can I fix k properly so that 1 plus kq will equal p? The answer is no. At least not by this in k equal an integer, which it has to equal an integer. Okay? And the reason is that p is strictly less than q. So if I make, for instance, k equal to 1 here, I'll get 1 plus q. That's far, you know, that's going to be over p. Okay, because q is bigger than p, so 1 plus q is certainly bigger than p. So no, you don't have the option of making this equal to p. So the only other option is then you could make it equal to p squared, maybe. But I claim that if you make this equal to p squared, the only way that this is going to work is if these are the correct primes for your group to be order 12, i.e. p is equal to 2 and q is equal to 3. I claim that's the only way this can work, i.e. that you can make... Uh, nq, which is 1 plus kq, equal p squared. That's the only scenario in which this can apparently work. So let me show you why. Okay, so what I would have to do then is I'd have to fix k such that 1 plus k times q was equal to p squared. That would imply that k times q is equal to p squared minus 1. But now a bit of algebra here. Okay, and you don't need to know ring theory to do this. We don't need to know rigorous uh, ring theory. You can just use classical algebra here if you're not familiar with uh, ring theory. What you can do, of course, is factorize this into p minus 1 times p plus 1. Okay, like so. Uh, and this is going to equal kq. Now, q is a prime number here. So on the left-hand side, when we take the prime factorization of the left-hand side, q will appear in the prime factorization of that. Now, the prime factorization here must equal the prime factorization here. And the prime factorization that we'll get here will be the prime factorization of this one times the prime factorization of this one. The prime q must appear in the prime factorization of one of these if it's going to appear in the prime factorization of the left-hand side. So again, you don't need to know rigorous ring theory to do this. Just use your understanding of classical arithmetic and classical algebra. Okay, so... Um, namely the fact that in the natural numbers you can uh, factorise things into prime factorizations, and the fact that if we've got two things multiplying to give something here, then the prime factorization of this one times the prime factorization of this one will make the prime factorization over here. So if we've got Q over here, it must have appeared in the prime factorization of one of these. So Q must divide either P minus 1 or Q must divide P plus 1. Okay, but this is better than we thought. Okay, it doesn't look particularly helpful, but then you remember that q is strictly greater than p. Is q dividing p minus 1 an option? Absolutely not. p minus 1 is certainly smaller than q. Okay, so this thing cannot contain q in its prime factorization. So now the only option is that this thing contains q in its prime factorization, but this is really, really limited, because look, uh, p, uh, sorry, q is strictly greater than p. Okay, so if Q is going to divide this, there's only one option here. Q actually has to equal P plus 1. Okay, that would m make it satisfy this, and it would make it satisfy this. If it was any bigger than P plus 1, then it wouldn't possibly be able to satisfy this. So the only option is that then Q is equal to P plus 1. So I have to find you a prime P and a prime Q such that Q is equal to P plus 1. Well, there are only two primes that satisfy that. Okay, because remember... Apart from the prime 2, all the other primes are odd numbers, so you cannot take one prime and add one onto it and expect to get another prime, because you'll end up with an even number. The only exception is 2 is a prime number. So if I add 1 to 2, I'll end up with an odd number, and therefore I'll end up with 3, and that's the only option, that's the only solution to that equation. Hence, we arrive at the fact, uh, this incredibly limited situation, that P 
must equal 2 and q must equal 3, which implies that the order of our group was equal to 12. Okay, so if the order of your group, which was, we know, p squared q, was not equal to 12, so if you weren't dealing with this very special example of a group of order p squared q, then all of this was impossible. You could not have had nq equal to p squared. It just does not work. You couldn't have done it. Okay, so for all the other examples of groups of order p squared q, the number of Seedorf q subgroups must equal 1, and therefore you have only one Seedorf q subgroup, and that will be normal in G. For this one special circumstance, which is groups of order 12, you can actually arrange this so that you have more than one Seedorf Q subgroup, okay? But we're, we're done in this case anyway, because from the video on groups of order 12, what I showed you is that any group of order 12 will either have only one Seedorf free subgroup, okay, so either you'll only have one Seedorf free subgroup, or the other option is that G is isomorphic to the alternating group on the set of four elements, but the alternating group on the set of four elements has only one seed of two subgroup, only one subgroup of order two. And as I say, if you're not familiar with this, do watch the video on groups of order 12, okay, where we prove this. Hence, um, any group of order 12 does indeed have a normal Seedorf subgroup, either a normal Seedorf 3 subgroup or a normal Seedorf 2 subgroup. Okay, so it still satisfies the theorem. So even this stupid case where the order of the group is equal to 12, this one special case uh, does satisfy the theorem, and therefore we can conclude that yes, this claim uh, is valid. Any group of order p squared q will contain at least one normal Seedorf subgroup, either for p or for q, and hence you can conclude that any group of order p squared q is not a simple group, okay? Uh, because remember the definition of a simple group uh, is one where the only normal subgroups are the trivial subgroup and the improper subgroup. Here I found an interesting subgroup, a proper subgroup, that isn't the trivial subgroup, uh, which is a normal subgroup, hence it can't be simple.